motivation. What's motivating these people and how is that different from what we saw in the Chesapeake? You got, ah, let's just, we got 50 more seconds for you to write, and then I'll let you share. Everybody writes first. Everybody writes first. Go right now. I just thought of that. Just take it up. Everybody writes. Glad you finally told me we could just take it out. Take two, dive in with your partner. How are these motivations, their whys? Why it is they're coming this direction? Uh, how does their motivation differ from what we saw in the Chesapeake and South America? Can I use the board or do you keep the calculations up? All right, two minutes, dive in. Chat up. Now is your chance to talk. Chat, chat, chat. sophomores three days ago, uh, but for the record, I think you guys did an exceptional job, and I think it's going to be a really big year. So I hope you guys feel as good about your decision to enroll in this class as I feel about making sure that I still have to teach this class despite having had many duties as well. So uh, I'm happy with you guys. It was going to be an awesome year. Uh, thing two, I hope the first week of your junior year was awesome. All right, junior year is a big year. It's a big, scary, stressful year. Uh, and I want you guys to be reminded of the fact that, A, I'm always going to be in your corner if you need anything. Uh, B, I know a lot of you guys are, are terrified and intimidated of me. I don't for the life of me know why. Um, I know white people are scary. I'm telling you about it. I hate, I hate them. They might shoot them to school or something. It's wild. Um, and it's important you guys, at the end of the day, you guys got to communicate. Got to communicate, all right? So, like, for the example of this weekend, if you're confused with the homework, you should have sent me a reminder. Send me an email, right? You guys all know how to communicate with me, but communicate, communicate, communicate. It's one of the things that I stress to all my A push juniors because when you guys get to college, it's, in my opinion, it's one of the biggest indicators of success. Being willing to like ask questions, ask for help, ask, reach out, uh, get the get the help you guys deserve. So uh, I thought it was a good first week. I'm super excited about it. Uh, I want to take a quick minute to introduce our new scholar A. He's back there. Uh, his name is Josue. What's up, guys? Uh, he's an absolute G. Uh, he's a one of a kind. I'll let him introduce himself and give you guys a couple quick words of advice, and then we'll get cracking from there. So all eyes on Josue. So my name is Josue, and I took the A push last year. Um, the only advice I have for you guys is to attend all the Thursdays and all the Saturdays. 
because it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Use, like a practice test. And so I went from like a three or like a four to like a five. Yeah. Like and I was able to like see what I needed to work on and stuff like that. And it's gonna get hard, but you guys got this. You guys got a great teacher. So, love you, dog. What'd you uh, what'd you get on the test? What was that? I got a five. Oh, you got you got a, oh, you got a five? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, why'd you get a five this way? Because you just listened and took care of your work. Came to every Saturday. Got Saturday. down to business when you needed to. After school's on Thursday until like six p.m. So. To me, like, this is just me being honest over you guys, like, Josue is, in my opinion, my favorite type of student. Not favorite student, he's, he's, he's up there, but favorite type of student, and that Josue was always really fun. He enjoyed the class, he made class fun, but he also took care of all his business, right? So I, I want you guys, like, this class, you guys should look forward to coming to class, right? We can laugh, sometimes we'll laugh at each other, sometimes we'll laugh with each other, it's the way it works. Um, but, but as long as, as you take that, that approach of, like, I'm going to go have a good time in class, but I'm going to take care of all my business, it's going to be a good year. Uh, and if, if last week's any indication, you guys will be just fine. You guys will be just fine. Uh, yeah, and like, like his point, uh, raise your hand if you stuck around last Thursday. A couple, like, like nine or ten of you guys did. Yeah, was it helpful? What a concept, right? So uh, I'll be here this Thursday until 5.30, 5.45. I'll be here every Thursday until 5.30, 5.45. I got to close the school at 6. We'll be here till then. And if one week we're not done at 6, guess what? We'll stay till 7. We're good to go. Um, except a week from Thursday, next Thursday, I'm gonna be out of town. I'm leaving right after this class is done. I have to get on the flight. So that Thursday is the only one all year that I'm not, not here for. Thursday. So let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about motivation. Justin, talk to me. Um, Motivate me. Sure, you talk whatever you want, big dog. The brother telling me we're um, mostly motivated by riches. Good. Riches, profit, and motivated. The Ah, what'd you say? Religious freedom. I'm going to tell you right now you're wrong. But you're, that's a very common misconception, and I'm glad you said that. I'm really glad you said that, because we're going to teach around this today, so that we're all on the same page about what exactly they're coming for religious-wise. Cool? I'm crossing it out. But they are coming for religious reasons. You are correct. Good. Good. Uh, how about over here on the Chesapeake? What else can we add to this side, motivation-wise? There's a couple of big words or themes that I used last week that I want you guys to be able to recall quickly. Individualism. That a boy. I see you. Individualism. They're coming for the pursuit of their own version of happiness, not collective happiness. <coughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. Cool. Talk to me then. Felix, what else do you want to add? Did they find gold? No. Then what the heck are you talking about gold for then? Talk to me. Yeah, land. Resources. Riches. Profit. They're profit motivated. Good. If you come away from this week, last week, and you can talk about Jamestown, the House of Burgesses, the development of the Carolinas and the slave codes and all that stuff, uh, and you can say for the South in general that they're profit motivated and very individualistic, I did my job. Now, on, on probably on Thursday after school, we can build on some of that stuff with some more deeper analysis. That's what Thursdays are for. Uh, but that's if we're right there superficially, we're in good shape. Talk to me more about doing the middle colonies. Other than religious reasons, what other reasons are they coming this direction? What are their motivations? Motivations. Dan, we're talking to me. Apparently not you. Uh, New England or the middle colonies? Did I not just say other? You asked to be my new scapegoat? Apparently it's you this year. I didn't ask to be a scapegoat. You actually say otherwise. I'm kidding, Sanford. I don't pick on you that much. Talk to you, Daniel. What else? Um, they came either because they were being persecuted by. Like, okay. yeah, to escape, escape. Yeah, to escape. persecution. Okay. Or to like, establish like a home if they were. Like, Why don't we put establish community? Okay. Or run away, like, run away slavery eventually. Sure, eventually. All right, that's reasonable. To establish community. We'll see that in some text today that he goes to find quite, quite eye-opening and interesting. Good, good. Good. Anything else? Uh, at the end of every discussion like this, I'm going to do this. Every time. I'm going to open it up to the floor for everybody in this room. And your job at that point is if there's something that you wrote down or your partner wrote down that we haven't added, that's on you. Hey, Winch, what about... 
blank. All right, because it's up to you guys to kind of fill in these gaps. Uh, to, oh, sorry, can you hit the, never mind, my bad. It's coming back. Uh, so if, if, if you two had a really good conversation, but it's not on the board yet, at this point, once we're done with each little conversation piece, hey, let me add this. And then you're going to add knowledge for the rest of us. Deal? So yes. What about like um, generating money by means of like trade? Trade. Yeah, trade, commerce, business. Yeah, it's not their primary motivator, but it's not far off. Good question. Good question. Cool. So today we're going to talk about the settlement and the growth of the New England colonies. And I'll give you a map and everything. The New England colonies and the middle colonies. And it's an identity that is rooted in religion and an identity that is rooted in trade. And not just trade, but the things that come with trade. Right? With trade comes new ideas because you're exchanging goods, but you're also exchanging ideas, exchanging people. With trade comes immigration. With trade comes culture. With, change, with trade comes progress. There's gonna be a reason, there's gonna be a reason, there's a lot of reasons. There's a reason though why, why we're gonna fast forward 200 years and the South's still gonna be stuck in their ways. And I think one of the reasons, other than, you know, there's, there's, there's racism and other terrible reasons, but one of the reasons is the fact that they're not really engaging in commerce, in business, right? They're just on their cash crops and they're being still individualistic and mind their own business. So like, when I say trade, I don't just mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy your three goats and you're gonna give, you know? That's not the trade I'm talking about, like the exchange of ideas, of people, of goods, of markets, etc. Yes? Did they ever benefit? Who's they? Did the Southern colonies ever benefit, or like did the majority of the profits just go to the crown? We'll talk about it. Oh, about like profits in the yeah. South? Like, did they ever become like the rich lads, or? It's a long thread of a story. The rich in the South are gonna be incredibly rich because of that plantation style system that's built up because of the handwriting system. Everybody else will be poor as shit. So then like the Southern colonies are more valuable mm -hmm. to the old regions than the Yes, in some ways. It's a very, we'll talk more details next week. It's a very finely tuned machine. Cool, your prompt is here. Take one minute with your partner, please. Kind of chop down together how you'd break this prompt up if you were going to write this prompt. Just to get your mind around what I'm going to ask you guys to do today. One minute, dive in together, then we'll start. Then lecture in class. One minute, dive in. It's on your notes. It's always on your notes. In italics. I love giving out resources. Uh, and then we'll actually work for the first time together as a, as, as a class to actually answer this prompt with a high level thesis. So I'm going to teach the rest of it today. I'm not going to ask you to be able to write it yet until I help walk you through it on Wednesday. Cool? So we're going to uh, circle back. Uh, I use my Wednesdays, now that we're into our actual first real week of regular schedules, I use my Wednesdays to either review something we've already learned, like I will this Wednesday, or preview something big that's coming up. Or we'll use it for a variety of ways like test prep, uh, how to attack different kinds of questions. A lot of like, essay outlining happens on Wednesday, he'll attest. A lot of essay outlining happens on Wednesday. Uh, so this Wednesday, we'll do that for the first time. We'll kind of preview what this essay would look like if we were going to write it. Deal? Deal. So your outline, I always give you the outline. It's on your notes as well. We're going to do the same thing we did with Jamestown, but we're going to do it with New England. Uh, what's the push-pull that's happening in New England? Uh, and how might that be different from what we saw in the Chesapeake in the South, in which their real pull was riches. Their motivation was getting wealth. We'll talk about a new piece. We'll talk about a new piece uh, and New England's society's foundations. We didn't talk about Jamestown society foundations because there, really, there weren't any. Uh, when you have an individualistic society, you're looking out for yourself, you don't really have the foundation of a real society, of community. You don't have these things of togetherness. We'll talk about religion in Massachusetts, which is where I'll have the opportunity to, to rebut that idea that they came from religious freedom, because I totally disagree with you. 
but I think you'll agree with me by the end. Uh, we'll talk about one of the huge similarities across all the colony, colonial regions, New England, Middle, Chesapeake, Deep South, uh, in that there's native conflict. Uh, if ever you get a question on the AP test about what's the similarity in the colonies, everybody has native conflict. Everybody has native conflict. And finally, we'll end with our middle colonies conversation. Um, the middle colonies kind of like a hodgepodge of a bunch of different ideas. They're kind of northern, kind of southern, but slightly in the middle. Um, but we're really only going to emphasize Pennsylvania uh, in terms of a, uh, like a case study, if you will, about what life is like in the middle colonies. Cool? Uh, and then by the end of today, we've got kind of it all figured out. And then we can move into what life is like on, on a regular basis for those who are living in these colonies. So after today, uh, we'll have taken care of the Chesapeake, which was last Thursday, the Deep South, which was last Thursday as well. Today we'll spend a lot of time way up here in New England. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end of the Middle Colonies as well. Cool? Uh, if you guys have a hard time remembering which one's where, uh, this is always helpful for me. New England is in the Northeast. And they have the same, uh, same uh, yeah, initials, acronym, if you will, N-E-N-E. -E -E. So Northeast New England. Cool. So some people always got confused with that. So now, now there you are. Cool. So what I want to stress to you guys, and I have a question for you. A very important question. How many of you guys have a sibling? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got a sibling. I'm sorry for you all. I got a, I got a brother. He's an idiot. I love him very much, but he's an idiot. Uh, he is, you're good. You're good. You're good. I'm, I'm taught like 90 of your siblings. I'm aware. Um, how come, uh, do you and your sibling have different characteristics? I'm curious. Why? What's crazy, I was, uh, I think I told you last week how this year I'm teaching 18 kids who I taught their older brother or sister, which is mind-numbingly high, right? Like, yes, 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 no. multiple, yes, of the point, there's a lot of them. Um, so, why? T take one minute to talk to your partner. Why do you and your siblings have different characteristics? Why do you see things differently? Why are there things that you like that your sibling doesn't like when you guys have, for the most part, the same genes? What the hell? One minute, dive in. Why? 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 Same like inputs, right? That you have the same, you know, for the most part, same mom, same dad, right? Not always. In your case, a different story. Um, but why? Why? Why are you different? Why? <laughs> what gives you those different personalities? I'm curious. I've taught both of your idiot brothers. Yeah. I'll probably still be here when your like three year old brother gets up here. I know, I know. I would be retired by now. Why do you and your brothers have different personalities? Ah, different experiences, different perspectives based on what you've lived through. How about like society itself, right? That. That if you're the firstborn son, you're treated differently than the secondborn son. 
Right? Or if you are uh, you have a brother and a sister, like the, the male may be treated different than, than, than the female. Agreed? Yes. Or she's kind of the way society works sometimes, right? For, for better or worse, it is what it is, right? Like the firstborn kid usually has like the most like harsh treatment and rules. And then by the time there's a third kid, they're like, whatever, just don't burn the house down. Like, man. <laughs> Agree, disagree? A little yes. bit of cat. Yeah. So with that in mind, I want to stress to you guys that we have four regions of colonies that all that are all, they all have same parents. They're all British. They all have the shared understanding of what it means to be a British person in the world with English rights and English responsibilities. Right? They all come for the most part from England, and yet they're going to have four incredibly different personalities. And it's important that maybe we take out the word personality because it doesn't sound very historical and replace it with the word identity. That they're all going to have very different identities even though they come from the same mom and dad, so to speak. Much like you and your siblings have very different personalities because of different experiences, different perspectives, right? Thank God you're not your oldest brother, Jonathan. I hate that kid. Good. I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, yeah, Jonathan, his oldest, are they your oldest brother? Yeah, he's a piece. Uh, he took my English class Probably the same year as, no, a year after Olga. So Jonathan took my English class, and he came out of the test, and he's like, man, that was the easiest test I ever took. Easiest I ever took. I got a one. <laughs> <laughs> the next year, I taught AP Gov. That's the first time I ever taught AP Gov. And I gave him a hard time all year. I was like, oh, yeah, easy test, huh? Easy test. Yeah, it was real easy. So for AP Gov, he came out of the test. He's like, no, which for real this time. Like, I, last year, I know, I know I messed that up. But like, for real that time, that was the easiest test I've ever seen in my life. Got a one again. <laughs> so, so thank God. Uh, but then the middle brother, Josh, he came out of eight push and said that was the easiest I ever took and got a five. So you know, maybe you're somewhere in between the two. You're gonna three, we'll take that. Um, so we have four distinct, not unified colonies. So because of this though, like as time's gonna go on, I'm gonna stress this to you guys, they're not gonna see themselves as Americans or as British American colonists. They're gonna identify themselves as Virginians. I'm a Virginian or I'm a New Englander, or I'm a New Yorker, or I'm a Carolinian. So their identity is going to be way more rooted in their region of identity than it is the broader idea of being American or being even British American. They're going to identify themselves very strongly with where they're settling because why they went there impacted what they did when they got there. So the first piece of, of, of Kant, yes, sir? Up to like a sense of like micro nationalism, or I guess not a nation, but like it's not micro nationalism, it's much more sectionalism. And, and we'll talk about that a lot, don't worry. A whole lot of it. I'm just trying to plant seeds right now, and then I water the seeds all year. Then you're, at the end, you're like, Holy shit, it all makes so much sense. That's why America is the way it is today. Um, so 1620s are big year for New England. What was our big year for uh, the Chesapeake? Come on, what was our big year for Jamestown? 1607. You're lucky this is only the second day, because that's pathetic. Y'all pathetic right now. Stansbury, I'm blaming you. Your patheticness is contagious. Boo, Stansbury. Burn it down. Oh, so 1607 is Jamestown, and then we talked about 1619. 1619 as a big year for the House of Burgesses and slavery. So a lot has happened in the Chesapeake. Right, they've gone through the starving time. They've eaten each other. It was lovely. Oh, that was a great text. I really enjoyed that. Watching you guys read that text was so much fun because you're basically like reading, yeah, really closely. Read, read, what the? Looking around like, anybody else eat these? Uh, they've gone through the starving time. They've gone through uh, looking for gold and failing. They've gone through um, democracy. They've, they've purchased their first few slaves, which are going to put us on a whole crazy uh, collision course as a society. Uh, they have begun a mass migration to the Chesapeake, which will result three years later, 1622, in the, uh, the Powhatan Wars that you guys read about the after effects of that. But in 1620, the Mayflower rolls up to New England. And we'll talk about why and how there. So we got 102 people. It's a very small boat, 102 people. Half of them are separatists. The other half are Puritans. Let me tell you the difference. It's in the name. Separatists want to separate altogether from the Church of England, the Anglican Church. They want to leave the Church of England and make their own church. The other half, the Puritans, they want to just fix the problems that exist 
within the Church of England. So both have very, very, very religious motivations. Both are, are very concerned with how society is practicing Protestantism. What they're mad about, what they're purifying, is Catholic influence in the Church of England. So here we go again with one of those early themes as well about conflict between Catholicism and Protestantism. Is that okay if I open the blinds a little bit? Cool. Yes? Between what? Uh, Mary. The main difference between, between Protestants and Catholics is Catholics uh, believe in praying to saints and praying to Mary, and Protestants believe that, the only, that only the Trinity exists, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yep, that. <laughs> so, this is where it gets a little more gritty, though, for the things that I want you to get your, your mind around. They're going to be very, 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 very anti-Church of England because of Catholic influences. Because of Catholic influences. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to leave England and go to Holland. Or the Netherlands, if you will. Same thing. To the Dutch. That country makes no sense to me. I don't know why there are all these names in the same country. It's very confusing. So they're going to go to Holland, but they're not happy in Holland because they, they still have society's pressures. If you go to somebody else's society to do your own thing, you still kind of have to fit into their society. Now, look at the immigrant experience in 2019 today, right? That people can come to America and they can still keep their identity, but they still kind of have to fit within America's society in order to be successful. It's kind of just the way it works. So they go to Holland and they don't like the fact that they still have to conform themselves to what Holland thinks. So they leave Holland and they come to the new world to create their own distinct identity. They want to make sure they can practice their religion without any outside pressures from the rest of society. Now, they made a deal with the Virginia Company, who, as you know, is uh, the joint stock corporation. There they, that phrase is again. They made a deal with Virginia to settle in Virginia's jurisdiction, just on the northern part of it. Let me go back to the map for you guys. Here's Jamestown. Here's the northern part of Virginia. So they're supposed to settle in North Virginia, right about here maybe, huh? That's North Virginia. And they instead settled here. You ever had this happen to you? Where you're about to go somewhere and then you get lost? And then you get to where you thought you were going and it's not the right place, but you're like, F it, I'm gonna just stay here anyway because I'm already here. That's what happened. They come all the way to the New World. They're way farther north than they're supposed to be, but they're like, I mean, we're already here. So they kind of just, Standard. Good navigating. Good navigating. And they, they, so they settle in Plymouth, which is way outside the control of the Virginia Company, and they become squatters, basically. They have no legal right to be there. The government didn't give them permission to be there. They have no authority to take that land, but they're kind of like, screw it, we're here, we might as well just settle in. Winter is coming, it's November. Uh, they don't really want to take a, another farther trip south, so they just kind of show up in Massachusetts and never leave. You know, like sometimes I'll like go to meet a friend, and like I realize that we, we met like the wrong the wrong restaurant. I'm, I'm just gonna stay here now. <coughs> I'm here. Cool. So I have a map up here for you to take a look at. I'm gonna let you talk to your partner in a second. I have orange areas that are colonized by Spain. Where do we see orange? Yeah, St. Augustine in Florida, right? Spanish Florida, not surprising. I have uh, green areas that are settled or colonized by the French. Right, right up here in the St. Lawrence River, which are gonna connect to the Great Lakes region and the Mississippi Valley, as I've told you before. I have blue, which is England, and I have purple, which is the Netherlands. I'll zoom in for you. We're very downloaded in wrong with Jerry. Um, take a minute with your partner. What do you notice about the patterns of settlement, European settlement in North America by 1660? What are trends? What's an observation you can make based simply on this map? One minute, go for it. Can ask for help. Or if no one's doing, I'll 
was like, oh, it's fine. Oh, interesting. All right, I'm stop you guys there. So, let us chat. Ariely, what do you notice? What's a trend? What's a development? What, what assumptions do we make based on this map, my friend? We noticed that they stayed on the coast. Oh, good! They stayed on the coast. All right, let's put that in a little more English language. They settled on the Atlantic seaboard. College Board loves that phrase, the Atlantic seaboard. It just means the East Coast. Good, right? Yeah, they settled on the coast. Question for you, bonus points. If they strayed from the coast, where did they settle? If they were to leave the coast, in some cases they did, where did they settle? Soil's part of it. It's a little more specific on this map, though. Talk to me. Uh, could it be like by the river? Though? Good! Right? That when they, when they settle away from the coast, it's going to be along other bodies of water. So I think it's a safe assumption to say that much of North American settlement in the first part of the 17th century is dominated by access to navigable water. Fancy way of saying they settle by the water. Well, you got to use big words. College boy loves big words. Right, Stansbury? Stansbury is a big word. That's right, so. What? Navigable, N-A-V-I-G-A-C-A-B-L-E. Now, hope you got that. Hopefully you got that. If you spell it wrong, it's okay. Good. What'd you just do to yourself? Did you try to read and hear his eye? I heard a wink. Oh, heard a wink? <laughs> Good. So, what these individuals on the Mayflower, who are going to settle right here, guys, along this, what will become all this New England settlement, what they do is before they even get off the boat, before they even get off the boat in Massachusetts, they're going to come together and write what's called the Mayflower Compact. What's compact mean? Agreement. Yeah. Agreement, contract, promise. Good. Uh, and, and I want to point out that this already is different from Jamestown. Because they're coming together to make some shared agreements before they even get off the boat. Which by itself is already pretty anti-individualism. Now I'm going to have you guys read it. I'm going to give you three minutes. And I'm not going to have you answer a specific question. But I want you to tell me what keywords or phrases help what keywords or phrases help you understand their motivation? How can you see their motivation in this compact, in this agreement? Reasonable? So what are the words or phrases that show you their why? Take three, I'll let you discuss with your partner, and then I'll show you what I would have identified if I was in your shoes. Yours better look just like mine. Three minutes to read, and then I'll give you a minute and a half to talk about it. Three minutes. Words or phrases that best understand their why, their motivation. the words or phrases that help you understand why it is they're there.
men on just American soil. Tomato last, I don't care. If it's You're running up. He's gonna put you all out of your hands. Anyway. Did you get a five last year? Oh yeah. So don't worry about it. Get off the space level. In the hallway today. <laughs> Look, don't speak to me. Man. <laughs> Seconds. Yeah. Seven seconds. All right, there's your time for reading. Now, what I want you to do with your partner is kind of compare. I want you to share A. Hey, these phrases to me, they really sh they help understand who these who these Puritans slash shepherdists, these people are. And then have your partner do the same thing. I, I underline these phrases because they help tell me. And I bet you'll have a lot of a lot of correlation, a lot of overlap. Take two with the person next to you and kind of dive in. What do you guys both identify as key words and phrases? Good, that's smart. That's really smart. Well done. Why'd you do that? if it was me in your shoes taking this text on. First thing I would identify if I was in your shoes is this right here. That's it. I'm starting right away with the word we. Really, it's the first word of the whole compact. First they give us yes in the name of God, amen. Right? I thought you put amen at the end of prayer, but who knows? Who knows, right? These people are wild. They're Puritans. The first word of their actual compact is we. Why is that important? What? Nah. Cool togetherness. We don't see individuals. Yes, sir? You said this is like that kind of like collectivism. Collectivism as opposed to I, I, I. That's important. Good. 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 Uh, and then I'm going to go down and be, okay, cool. Very important. They got three priorities. First, glory of God. Second, advancement of the Christian faith. I thought that was the same thing, but here we are. And third, honor of our king and country. So they have three priorities for their why, their motivation, what the hell they're doing here. And the first two are explicitly mentioning of God and Christianity. And the third's like, yeah, we're going to make England better too. 
I think it's important the order they listed these things in. First was God. Second was God. Third was, oh yeah, that king dude to it. Right? And then we're making this promise, ooh, in the presence of God. But not just God, also in the presence of one another. That we're make, we're make, this is very important for our next slide, our next question. Is that they're making a, a, a compact with God and a compact sideways with each other. Interesting. Yada, yada, yada. Just lean back up and get a second. We're going to come back. Ooh, another one. Ourselves. Ourselves. <laughs> Into a civil body politic. We're going to come together into a group to make political decisions together. Again, very different from what we saw in the Chesapeake. And there's other important stuff. We're going to enact uh, ooh, just and equal laws. There's societies built on equality and fairness. That's new. That's different. That's exciting. Snap to you, Mayflower people. And we're going to meet and we're going to do everything that might be the most important piece of this, other than the we, our, we, our, we. We're going to make decisions for the general good of the colony. If you did not identify a general good, you fell short. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm not going to hold it against you. Because very few people actually did. But I saw, I think, three of you identify a general good. But that's important, because that is the antithesis. This is the opposite of individualism, is the general good. This means that maybe we're going to pass a law that Brenda doesn't like. Sorry, Brenda, it's for the general good of society. All right? Maybe Daniel's going to pay a tax he doesn't like. All right, Daniel, it's for the better good of society. So this we, this us, this together, in which we promise all do submission and obedience. We, our, we, our, general good, us, ourselves, etc. There's a whole bunch more. What kind of words do you want to like associate with this type of document? What 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 themes can we pull out here? What did you say? That's a verb. Community. Community is the big. That's that was my best case scenario. You'd say thank you. You're back on my good side. Community. Togetherness. Like Daniel said, collectivism. We don't see them saying they're gonna like share money or anything, but they're gonna like make decisions for the for the greater good. Hmm. A little different. But with this, as I just said, gives us a two-way promise to go to your page, that I want you guys to be pretty aware of for what ramifications this has for society as a whole. With this covenant theology. A covenant is a promise or an agreement or a shared understanding. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a, a two-way promise that's being made. The first promise is the people and God. And they're promising, as Puritan communities of God, that they're going to uphold the Christian faith. That's promise one. But that maybe arguably the more important covenant, if we go back to here, is with each other. This social covenant, this social agreement, this social promise is that... Let me use you as an example. We're both Puritans now. Obviously, I'm a very pure man. Uh, never sinned in my life. I think I've only sworn like 12 times in the fifth period today. I don't need you to roll your eyes back there. <laughs> I have a clear conscience. So we're both Puritans. And this social covenant is basically saying two things. I got your back, but I also have your front. Let me tell you what that means. Like, I'm going to look out for you in terms of the general good, but I'm also going to watch to make sure that you're behaving the way you're supposed to behave. Likewise... You're going to look out for my better good, but you're going to be checking my behavior as well. Let's get into this a little bit. This idea of a social covenant is going to require mutual watchfulness, that we're all going to have to watch each other to make sure you're not sinning. You're for sure sinning. You're not sinning. I'm watching you. I don't want to see no sin. No sin. You're not even in our community. <laughs> no sin. I'm watching you. All right, we can't be doing any of that sinning stuff. So this, this social covenant is a promise to each other to hold everybody accountable to the same biblical standards of purity. 
Tell me, does this sound like a boring ass place to live? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in, this, in this social covenant, we're not going to tolerate any misbehavior. We're not going to tolerate any deviance. We're not going to tolerate you doing your own thing. Like, no, we, pro- we came here for one reason and one reason only. That was to make perfect our religious practices. So if you're out of line, or if you're out of line, you're for sure out of line. Then, then there's no tolerance for that. Which means you have a society with no privacy. You have a society with no uh, um, flexibility, right? There's no gray area. Either you're following the Bible exactly or you are not. This pure Christian community that requires mutual watchfulness. So now raise your hand if you want to live in this place. Yeah? Yeah? So they can kick you out? I like that. I like that. But it's important that we understand why. Right? They're going there to purify their religious practices, so it makes sense that they would then hold everybody accountable to this idea. Now, by 1629, they're given a royal charter. Uh, and again, they're still trying to escape religious attacks by those in the Church of England who want to con- continue pursuing the Anglican Church's practices. But because people are going to be fleeing persecution, we see by 1630 a thousand people come in 11 well stocked ships. I want to point out this phrase right here that they are well stocked. What does that mean they're planning on doing? Yeah, staying a while, settling, building community, right? Uh, the people in the Chesapeake never had well-stocked ships. They were there to just get rich and then move on with their lives. So 11 well-stocked ships. Uh, this next wave is going to establish a bigger colony with Boston as its center. We'll talk a lot about Boston in the next two months. A lot about Boston in the next two months. Uh, and this is what leads to something you guys asked last week, the Great Migration. Uh, of, of Puritans and separatists leaving England because of what's happening leading up to the English Civil War over Catholicism in the church. Uh, and we have about 70,000 Puritans come to America in the next few decades. That's a lot. 70,000 people into a new, brand new colony is a lot of people coming in, settling, and building community. Look at this guy. Go like a right there. Looks a little bit like Gilberto. Now you know what Make that face. Everyone, look, everyone look at your birthday. You guys don't see, see the resemblance? I bet you don't see this. That looks a little bit like you. What? His nose, huh? Yeah, yeah, there it is. It's all right, bro. John Winter was a big deal. Maybe you guys are related. So, I'm going to let you read his text in a minute, but I'm going to introduce this guy. John, John Winter is one of those very important need to know names of Apush that when you see his name, you immediately associate who he was and what he did. So now this is our third John you've learned this year, and nobody else has been important. We got John Smith, John Rolfe for tobacco, and now John Winthrop. Right? Americans are boring as hell with their name, right? John. Um, he's the first governor of Massachusetts. So he's the guy that's going to be in charge of this colony. And his his belief is that he's there because God sent him there. God gave him a calling to go lead these people in Massachusetts, these Puritans in their pure pursuits of a religious society. And he's actually going to be in charge of Massachusetts for 19 years. It's a long time. It's a long run, he has. Now, of all the period two texts that you'll get in front of you, I'm going to argue this is probably one of the, of the two or three most important. And it's going to be a text titled, it's next in your notes, A Model of Christian Charity. But it's more famously known as his City on a Hill speech. 
So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you read the first four numbered points and answer the questions on the right. You're going to read the first four, you're going to read them closely, uh, answer the questions on the right, and then you're going to stop right there. When you get to number four, you're stopping. Cool? And then I'll give you further directions. So read those first four, answer those first four questions, just in bullet points is okay, and I'm going to give you five minutes to do so. You're reading, and your reading starts right now. Yep, now you're reading with way more context. Hurry. Gotta make up some time, guys. Come on, come on. What are his goals? What work does he want to get done? How's he going to accomplish these goals? together on Thursday time and it's only our second like real lecture. Okay. Ninety seconds. I see a lot of you guys are reading aggressively. I like it. Get after your text, answer as much as you can. Skim is appropriate as long as you can figure out what he's trying to do with society and why. And I'll let you dive into which part.
one minute, please, the person next to you. I want to make sure that we're not falling too far behind on time. One minute to focus in on question three specifically. All right. What are his goals? What does he want to do with his community? What is he trying to build and why? All right. Take a minute, share with the person next to you. There's all kinds of goals that are sprinkled throughout this. So however far you read, there's some you can reference. One minute to talk about it, and then we'll break down into class. Dive in. Go. Yeah. <laughs> to get rid of outside corruption. Uh, yes, better preserve the common corruption of the evil world to, world to serve the Lord, to work for our salvation. Interesting. However, in number two is another point that I want to emphasize. Number two. Dry guys, number two. In such cases as this, the care of the public must oversway all private respect. Then that is again the second time we've seen that reference to the fact that yeah you want that for yourself but if it's not good for society as a whole sorry sorry interesting and then all the other nice things we must love one another bring into familiar and constant practice the beauty of love we must love brotherly without dissimulation unless you're not white male we must love one another with a pure heart we must bear, there's another one, bear one another's burdens. If you're struggling, we got to support you, yes. Oh, Jesus to make the point where they, would, they do the same with the different things, but they can also be better. Like, yeah, awesome. to be better, to purify, to be perfect. Good. Turn your page. Finish that last chunk off. I'm going to give you four minutes. And I want you to focus on the last question. Why is it so important, according to Winthrop, to build, in quotations, this metaphor of a city on a hill? And then we'll dive into that metaphor for a minute, Why, what it means, because we're going to reference it again way later in A-Push. Reagan's going to reference it. Why don't we reference it? Four minutes to finish it off and answer my last two questions. Four minutes. Go. Now. So then you're done reading for a minute. I'll get after it. Reading, you're finishing. There's two more questions. Why is it so important he create this city on a hill? Wild how like one little part of one 
else that can be really neat on this. I can do that next week. Mm -hmm. One bullet point. Yeah. Hmm. Every bullet point matters. Mm -hmm. One slide might be the DBQ. I mean, last year. Yeah. 90 seconds. You're reading. I, I know it's after lunch. I still need you guys focus. Unless you're ready to take your period two test today, then. No, not today. Well, shut up and read. All right, time is up. Take one whole minute with the person next to you. I want you to dive in on that metaphor of we're going to be a city on a hill. One minute, dive in. What does he mean? Why? Why, why is this such an important mind frame to get our minds around in terms of what New England's doing? One minute to talk about it. Go. Go. City on Hill, kid. Society, this perfect Christian society in which they do everything perfectly right. Go. To add on to your point, kind of like just mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned to my partner that they kind of they left England for um and with everything like they have, so they gave up everything just to create like this society for themselves, and they wanted to prove that they can separate from the Anglican Church and yep. carry on their own religion and be the best right. religion and even carry on like the best colony. So why is it so important for them to be perfect? Because they left England because it wasn't perfect enough. So if they leave England because England's not perfect, and then they create a society that's not perfect, haven't they just become hypocrites? But does this sound, sir, like that place that would experience religious freedom? 
No. So my argument to you always is that they did not come here for, for, for religious freedom. They came here for freedom of their religion. Big difference. But everybody and their mother is like, oh yeah, they came for religious freedom. Sure. As long as you are right in line with exactly what John Winthrop says you have to do. So Winthrop in this speech, he emphasizes a common spiritual goal to create this perfect, ideologically ideal, fantastic, utopian society or colony in which everybody's perfectly following God the same way. And that's going to create some pretty unique trends that I think are important for you to know. First, as opposed to the Chesapeake, when we largely have single men coming, for New England, people are coming as families. Big difference. That demographically speaking, people are coming with their entire families and they're settling their entire families. Right? Same reason on Thursday we talked about if you're going to get rich, you take yourself. If you're going to build community, you bring your community. Second, New England's a way healthier place to live. Why? Common good. They're building a society that looks out for each other. Whereas in the Chesapeake, they're building a society that looks out for themselves. So this idea that you see in the Mayflower Compact, in the city on a hill of common good, common good, us, we, that means you're going to build a healthier society. And three, settlers often sacrifice their own self-interest for what's good for the whole. You gave me the answer to this question. I didn't just stare. You good today? You're not good today? Were you good yesterday? Will you be good tomorrow? Well, then just figure it out. So, as Massachusetts grows, it's important that I point out to you guys how and why it builds the structures that it does. What happens in Massachusetts, in New England as a whole, is that, that most decisions are made via town meetings. So we have the House of Burgesses in Virginia, we have town meetings or town councils in Massachusetts, which is where democracy is going to grow there. Now, we don't really like democracy in Jamestown in Virginia because you have to be a landowner in order to participate. In Massachusetts, you're going to have to be a church member to participate. So we see zero separation of church and state. You need to be a church leader to be a political leader and a political leader to be a church leader. So for the most part, things are being governed. The whole political system is being built on what God wants, not on what the people want. I will give New England credit in that, for the most part, all adult male church members can vote. So in terms of like social class, if you're poor, middle class, or rich, but you're a church member, you get to vote. So that's good. There's no social uh, economic requirement in order to, to participate. Women and black people are allowed to join the church, but are not allowed voting privileges. So in some ways, it's more democratic than the South because there's no like economic restriction on people. But in other ways, it's less democratic because you need to be part of the church in order to have a role, in order to have a say. So they're going to build their society built on religion, as you've seen. We're going to create a society in which um, most people participate because most people are Puritan, so most people have a say politically because they have the same religion. Um, Massachusetts is going to be way more advanced than every other colony in terms of laws and courts. They're going to create legal systems that create uh, rights and order for people, and courts that maintain order and figure things out. It's going to be a very stable place to live. New England will be very stable versus the Chesapeake and South, which are much more unstable and a little more chaotic. So stability is important if we're talking about New England's characteristics. Stability is an important characteristic. But that stability is built by the seeking of the common good. Now who are these people? Check this out. They aren't dying. Unlike Jamestown where everybody's dying, people are living an average of 70 years old in Massachusetts. That's 400 years ago. Living to 70. That's impressive. Now, I'm not going to live to 70. And it's 400 years later. You mean 50 years? Yeah, I'm kidding, guys. Uh, most people are living with their extended families, and that it's not just individualistic. The people have their aunts, their uncles, their siblings. Everybody lives close together in towns. Uh, each family averaged about six kids. That's a lot of kids. That's average. 
Average family has six kids. And, yes, sir? So they become more like also more than more populated? Yes. Yes, much more densely populated. Because they're not, keep in mind, there's no head right systems. People aren't getting a bunch, they're not getting big plots of land. Because there's no cash crops. Uh, women are actually getting married at 22 years old, which is pretty old for the 1600s. Right? For most of Europe, women are getting married in their teens. 22 years old, so they're living a little longer before getting married. Men are being married at the average age of 27. Which is wild, because even in 2019, Maltes is still single. So, uh, fun fact for those of you to kick around in your head, still remember this. Uh, it is said by many historians, people that study this, that the New England colonies invented grandparents. The New England colonies invented grandparents. It was the first place in the world where consistently people lived long enough to watch their kids have kids. It's crazy, huh? The, the New England colonies invented grandparents. Such a healthy place to live that people are living long enough to watch their kids have kids. Kind of nice. Kind of nice concept. I love my grandparents. So this is a nice map of the New England colonies and what they're doing economically. My next question, I'm going to have you take a minute and answer the person next to you. Uh, how does geography and climate impact the development of what they do economically? Take a minute, dive in. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, but in a minute, we'll talk about it as a class as you answer this question in partners. One minute, dive in. Go for it. Go for it, go for it. Oh, it's uh, it's a little bit more than that. Better hurry. You got it. Forty-seven seconds. Hurry. Talk to me, please. Uh, Brian, what kind of economic activities? What? Yeah. OK, what'd you do about it in that minute? Yeah. Stansbury, what we got? Yeah, a lot of timber. Why do they have a lot of timber? They had a lot of trees. There's a lot, a lot of forests, so they cut down the forests and sold wood. With timber comes a lot of shipbuilding. They turned a lot of that timber into ships because they're going to need to get goods in and out since they can't really grow their own since this rocky soil and poor climate. Grow their own. We see a lot of fishing. Why? There's a lot of fish. We see whaling, killing whales, because whale blubber or whale fat. Uh, is a valuable fuel source for lamps and whatnot. I'm sure that smells amazing. Burning fish fat for your for your lights. Mm. Tasty. Yeah, there you go. Um, we see some iron, as there's a lot of iron ore to be farmed, uh, and some rum distilling. But it's important that we don't see cash crops up here, nor do we see like subsistence farming. Cool. So go ahead and turn that page, and we're gonna kind of prove my points. Prove my point to Justin about religious freedom. So I have two examples. Both of them are from your weekend read, but I want to dive into them a little further. The first is Roger Williams, who looks like a young teenage Mr. Bush. He's great. So Roger Williams is going to be one of two examples for how we don't have religious freedom at all. And it is, in fact, a very unfree society. He's a young, popular minister in Salem, which is about 50 miles north of Boston. Big city. Uh, also, where you're, I'm sure you guys heard of the Salem Witch Trials. We'll talk about that in class next week. But he's a popular minister in Salem, and he is going to have some ideas that are, are different. He's a separatist. So he wants to break up with the Anglican Church altogether. But what, that's whatever, do you think? The reason he's, he gets kind of 
frowned upon is he's very anti the Massachusetts Bay Charter. The permission that England gave them to exist there in 1629, he's going to condemn that. He's going to condemn that. He's going to condemn that for one specific reason, in that it does not pay money to the Indians for the land they took. Interesting. He's going to say, wait a second, if we're going to practice this perfect Christian life, we're really going to practice this perfect Christian life on stolen land? Think about it. And he's going to say, like, yeah, if we're going to create this perfect, pure society, we can't have it on a foundation of theft. So we should have paid the Indians for their land. Interesting. His second piece is arguably more radical, but I agree with it very strongly. He's going to say, wait a second, wait a second. There is zero reason our civil government, our, po our political government, should have any regulation over what we do religiously. Let me run that back for you guys. That our elected officials, people that are making political decisions about taxes and laws and courts, all that stuff, why would they tell us how to practice our religion? Wasn't that part of our problem with England? Was that it was the government telling us how to practice our religion? So he's saying like, yeah, we should be a perfect pure society and we should have a civil government to make our laws, but they should not be the same thing. Quick show of hands, who agrees with Roger Williams on principle for those two things? I think so. So what do they do? Because they're such a free, tolerant society, they found him guilty of preaching new and dangerous ideas. And they kicked him out to Rhode Island. I freaking love Rhode Island. Let's go. So in 1636, Roger Williams leaves Massachusetts and goes to Rhode Island. Now the people in Massachusetts, they wanted to send him back to England. You know why? They didn't want the competition. They realized if we have a neighbor colony, which is like a cooler version of us, people are gonna wanna go there. So they tried to send him to England, he's like, nah, screw you guys. I'm gonna go make my own place, Rhode Island. I'll show you where it is on the map. Here's Rhode Island. It's right here, so just south of Massachusetts. Funny enough, it is not in fact an island. I have no idea why it's called that, but here we are. So he doesn't go back to England. He gets found guilty of preaching new indigenous ideas, and he leaves and goes to Rhode Island. Now, why you go somewhere impacts what you do when you get there. Here that is again. Why did he go to Rhode Island? Why? No, why, why did he go to Rhode Island? He was kicked out for being too open-minded. So what's he going to do when he gets to Rhode Island? He's going to be open-minded. Exactly. You guys are so smart. You guys are so smart. So in Rhode Island, Roger Williams creates remarkable political freedom. Remarkable. Because why he had to go there impacts what he's going to develop once he's there. Rhode Island is the only place in the colonies that has universal male suffrage. There's zero requirements to vote except be a dude. So I know that sucks for you ladies, but keep in mind this is then the most democratic place on earth at this time. That there's no land requirement, no property requirement, no money requirement, no religious requirement. If you're a dude, you can vote. It's pretty progressive. Rhode Island is very opposed to any sort of special privileges, special freedoms. Everybody's equal. It's the one place that actually backs up this idea of all men are created equal. So my favorite part about all this uh, is the rest of New England, all these pure people, they refer to Rhode Island as the sewer. Because it's where all the trash goes. Because in their mind, all these people are leaving Massachusetts because they're trash, they're unpure. They're the dirty people. Whereas everyone in Rhode Island is like, this place is awesome. Right, like ever seen that thing online? Like, I can't wait to go to hell because all my friends are gonna be there. Yeah. Right, <laughs> same. That's what Rhode Island's gonna be like because it's all the people that weren't Perfect. The dissenters, people that weren't perfectly Puritan, are, are dumped, so to speak, in the dumping ground for the unbelievers and the religious dissenters. But because it's full of a bunch of cool people that don't want to follow the Puritan way of life, it is a very liberal, very progressive, uh, very forward type of colony. Why? Because why you go somewhere impacts what it is you do when you get there. So of all the colonies we've talked about so far, how many of you guys would prefer to live in Rhode Island? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I agree. Uh, where would you want to live then? 
Virginia, if you're rich, but you're not rich, so yeah, there you go. I didn't ask for your life story. I'm really sorry you're not rich. I just want to you. Now, the second example is Anne Hutchinson. Now, the problem with Anne Hutchinson is what I consider the most attractive quality of any person, man or woman, is that she is intelligent, strong-willed, and well-spoken. Ladies, I encourage you to do all this in your life. I, I don't care what job you get in life, I don't care where you go to college, I don't care who you marry or don't get married, whatever, but be intelligent, be strong-willed, you stand up for yourself, and be well-spoken. Take you a long way in life. I married an intelligent, strong-willed, well-spoken woman, and it's the best thing ever. Ladies, be that. Men, find one, marry her. So, the problem is, yeah, life advice, there you go. Actually, I need you to just start answering your question. Let's start with that, and then we find your wife. Now, Anne Hutchinson's demeanor is going to threaten patriarchal control. Because the idea is that only men can be intelligent. Only men can be well-spoken. Only men can speak out. And Anne Hutchinson's like, screw you guys. She believes in antinomianism, which basically is fancy words for saying, why can't I, as an individual, talk to God myself? Why do I need the pastor to tell me what God has to say? Why can't I have a direct relationship with God myself? Via prayer. But at the time, no, no, no. No. Women, you can't pray for yourself. Men are the spiritual leaders of the household. Men are the spiritual leaders of the community. Uh, and the idea of women having a direct relationship with God is very dangerous. It's not, but, you know, Massachusetts stays Massachusetts. This is against the law. Uh, and in her opinion, being saved didn't mean that you had to obey the law of God, laws of God or man, because that all came from men. Being saved, in her opinion, meant having your own personal relationship with Jesus, uh, according to the teachings of the Bible that she understood them as. But here she is making her own ideas. What a terrible idea. Making her own ideas. And it's that that's going to get her in trouble. So, of course, she is also then banished to Rhode Island. Right? Unfortunately, uh, shortly after, she and her family are attacked by Indians, and she dies. And our friend John Winthrop, who we just read about, said to the community in Massachusetts, you see, she went against God, and God sent the Indians to kill her. Fact. Here it is. Uh, she's killing an Indian attack in New York, and John Winthrop says this was God's will. This was God's will. So that goes to show you that, that puritanical perspective of everything is God's will, and since she went against our community, she died. So big picture, what we see, though, is that what starts in just Massachusetts Bay is going to start branching out with all these 70,000 settlers that are coming. We're going to go south to Plymouth. South to Rhode Island, my favorite sewer, a little bit south uh, west to Connecticut, north to New Hampshire, and the very successful uh, Massachusetts colonies is going to grow into a whole series of New England colonies that are quite successful. However, however, their relationship with natives are going to be not so great. A good similarity of all colonial regions. Uh, Indians are very weak in New England mostly because of disease. In the first 30 years of colonization, so 1620 to 1650, 1620, there's our first year from Massachusetts, to 1650, three quarters of the Indians are gonna die of disease, mostly smallpox. Three quarters of them are gonna die. Now at the beginning, the Wampanoags, the tribe, are gonna befriend the settlers. Who knows the story of the first Thanksgiving? Isn't it lovely? I'm sure we're in third or fourth grade. You, you made like some stupid uh, hat with feathers, right? Super racist. Super racist. You're like, yeah, the hand turkey. There we go. Absolutely. I learned that they ate meal. Yeah, you did. Um, and important name here is Squanto. He's a, a Native American uh, who helps facilitate a relationship between the two. Uh, and even in 1621, the, next, the first full year they're there, the chief of this tribe signs a treaty uh, giving away some of the land to the British settlers. Autumn of 1621, both groups celebrate the first Thanksgiving. That part of the story is, in fact, rooted in fact. 
That does happen. But what did it take for the Indians in the Chesapeake to get mad about white settlers? What did it take? Why did the Indians depend on Thursday? Why did they get mad about white settlers? Talk to me. Because they had already invaded their land yep. and they were bringing in more people. Bringing in more people. So it's that the first wave is like, who are those pale people? They seem all right. And it's when they start bringing 70,000 of their friends, right, then that becomes a problem. Right? If you have a party and, and your, your friend brings one extra person that wasn't invited, like, oh, what's the big deal? Right? But if they bring their whole ass family, aunts, uncles, cousins to your party, like, what are you doing? And that's what leads us to the Pequot Wars. So 36 and 37, I don't need you to know a bunch of details about these wars, just what region they're in and what the outcomes are. The Pequot tribe is a very, very powerful tribe in the Connecticut River Valley. White people, during this war, white settlers in New England, these followers of Christ, are going to make friends with one tribe to attack the Pequot tribe. And in the process of doing so, they're going to set fire to all their villages. And as women and children are fleeing, they're going to be shot as survivors. It's these Pequot Wars, if you know just the fact that they happen in New England, and they virtually annihilate the Pequot tribe, that's good to know. But because this tribe, this powerful tribe that's on the edge of New England settlements, this tribe is gone, there's a pretty uneasy peace for the next 40 years. Because the Indians don't have enough people to resist. So this war happens, you know, 16, 17 years into New England settlements. But what it does is it creates peace for the next 40 years because there's no more Indian resistance. For now. 40 years later, we'll have our, really our last Indian war in New England, which is kind of sad to think about. And that's King Philip's or Medicomet's war. King Philip is his white name, Medicomet is his native name. And sure enough, 1675, 40 years before, 1636. Cool, so about 40 years of peace in New England. And in those 40 years, what's happening? People are having six kids per family, people are getting married, 70,000 more people are coming from England, so the, the, the civilization is getting stronger and stronger and stronger in white New England. Now, Medical Med is a smart dude. He's a Native American chief called King Philip, and he says to his fellow Indian tribes, hey, I know maybe we don't get along or we're not best friends, but we have a common enemy. Who's their common enemy? White people. White people, agreed? Like maybe these tribes fought in the past, or maybe these tribes fought in the past, but right now, we have one enemy, and it's the fact that we got 10,000 white people showing up every year in our, in our territory. And his argument is the only hope for us to resist white settlers is to unite together. My tribe and his tribe and his tribe and, and his, maybe even Kevin Scott Garcia's tribe. Who knows? And, and Medical Met is the son of this dude. This, this treaty signer from 1621. So 50 years later, it's this guy's son who's like, we signed a treaty with you, we promised you this land, you took 10 times that land. So it's his son who's trying to create this alliance with Native Americans to push back on white encroachment. Now it's a great idea. Uh, they unite all these Indians, they stage a bunch of crazy attacks at the same time on all these white villages out on the frontier. It's very successful in the short term. White settlers are going to have to retreat and leave their possessions and go all the way back to Boston for protection, for safety. It's a big, big, big success for Native Americans in the first two, three months of this war. There's medical man. Look at him. Good looking nose ring. What's up? So uh, you can see that all these black dots are white settlements that are attacked basically at the same time very coordinated effort by the Native Americans. Unfortunately, long term, the war ends in massive failure. Because over time, the white people have more people, more technology, more infrastructure. The war ends in failure for the Indians. As a result, Medical Met is beheaded. They cut his head off. And he's drawn and quartered, which means stretched out on like poles and cut down the middle. As an example to other Native Americans, don't try this at home. I know, it's beautiful. Beautiful. At least they didn't eat him like they were in Jamestown. 
Um, and his son and his wife are sold into slavery. But I thought this was a nice, beautiful place that's pure and built on Christian values. You see my point? The sad part is that never again is there any sort of, of Native American threat in New England. This entire region, it took them 45 years. I apologize. 55 years. From 1620 when the first 102 people showed up. From 102 people in 55 years, you have thousands and thousands of Native Americans and no more resistance. 55 years is incredibly fast for transition like that to happen in life. So take a minute. Look at this demographic uh, trends, if you will. Draw a conclusion and an inference, and then we'll finish strong with our last 20 minutes of class. One minute. Talk to your partner. What are some conclusions? What are some ideas? I know, I know. One minute. One minute. Drive here. Three ten. Another 20 minutes. No, time flies. No. Go ten. Go Settlement starts very slow, but by the mid to late 1600s, we're seeing a huge increase in white settlement. Likewise, Native American population is quite high, but from 1620 to 1670, it's basically decimated. It's like a 50 year genocide, it's crazy fast. Crazy, crazy fast. You go ahead and turn your paper over. There's a text uh, about King Philip's or Medical Met's War. I'm going to have you skip it for right now so we can finish on time. I'm going to urge you to come back to it, but it's going to look a lot like what you read on Thursday. About, hey, they started it, they attacked us, and then we used it to just kind of justify the fact that we just kept taking the rest of their land. Because it's, it's a good, I told you on Thursday, it's a, it's a cycle of repeat. See it again just like we saw on Thursday. So I'm going to urge you to read it on your own, but not in class right now. I want to make sure we give the, the proper 20 minutes to the middle colonies. There they are. The middle colonies. Aren't they beautiful? They are, I agree. Thank you, Antonio. So, the main ones that really, nobody cares about New Jersey. This is true in 2019. Right? The only thing New Jersey has ever given us is the Jersey Shore, which is quite possibly the worst television show ever created. Um, I know, I like it too. It's pretty much, it's, it's fantastically entertaining. I feel better about my life watching those videos. Um, so, we have New Jersey, uh, and then we also have Delaware. Now, raise your hand if you ever knew Delaware existed until right now. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's the last time I'm going to mention Delaware until not mention Delaware. However, New York is going to play a vital role, and Pennsylvania is going to play a vital role. So, big picture though, if I zoom out on the entire region, the middle colonies are, there's a couple really important trends that I need everybody to be on point for. First, they have elements in their economy that are kind of southern and some that are kind of northern. So they're, they're really gonna focus on shipbuilding. Why? Because the two biggest shipping ports are in the middle colonies. New York, which is right here, and in Philadelphia, which is right here. So because there's so much trade happening in and out of the middle colonies, specifically from Philadelphia and New York, they're gonna focus heavily on building the ships that facilitate that trade. Makes a lot of sense if you think about it. They're going to focus on small scale farming. What was the emphasis? What kind of farming in the South? Cash crops. Now, this is not cash crop farming. This is, the, I'm going to zoom down here to where it says bread basket. It's the middle colonies that are considered the bread basket farm. 